I'm just here to destroy. So uh, it's definitely a, a, a learning curve for me uh, where I'm just used to, to breaking the thing down just to break it down versus breaking it down to actually get some value out of it and turn it into something cool. So uh, yeah, I really appreciate all the support and, and all the help so far. It's It's been a great journey. Outstanding, outstanding. So we're getting close uh, kind of to the start point, uh, just a minute or two out. Um, again, for those joining um, in the actual um, Zoom um, webinar, uh, there is a button down there where you can actually post questions. I, uh, I encourage you to please do so. Uh, the goal is, is we will try to um, answer any questions that come up uh, if we have the answer. Um, U-boot's kind of an amazing topic, and um, uh, none of us claim to be uh, know possibly everything out there. But we'll do our best to be able to give you some um, good feedback on your questions. Also, after this is all over, I'll be jumping over to Discord. I think Garrett will be there also in the uh, IoT Village Discord. Uh, in the speaker area. So if you have any follow-up questions after that, please uh, reach out to uh, Garrett and, uh, and or me or Jonathan, uh, and we'd be more than glad to help you out. So we're kind of at the uh, go point. So I'm going to turn this uh, all over to uh, Garrett to go ahead and get started. So it's all yours, Garrett. All right, right on. Well, appreciate everyone uh, taking some time out on Saturday. I know that normally we're in Vegas right now, so it would be no harm or no foul to be taking time out on a Saturday. But appreciate y'all, uh, you know, taking some time and and uh, tuning in today. Uh, so, without further ado, let's get this party started. So you should be able to see my screen. Uh, we're looking at the U boot. Uh, DC 28 IOT Village is what we're going to be going over today. So we got a couple agenda items to go over real quick. You know, what is UBoot? First off, we're going to get that out of the way. Uh, and then we're going to go into pin glitching uh, a Philips Hue device uh, and then potentially getting root on that machine. And then we're going to switch, switch gears a little bit and go over some common problems with uh, Daryl Hyland. And that's common problems related to U-Boot and how U-Boot can solve them. Uh, then we're going to be routing a Luma Wi-Fi access point. It's like a mesh Wi-Fi device uh, utilizing TFTP. And then following that, we're getting faded. So that's the agenda for the day. Uh, and uh, without further ado, let's get this party rolling. So what is U-Boot? So U-Boot is basically a universal bootloader. It's loaded by the system's ROM or read-only uh, memory uh, or BIOS. Uh, and, and from any one of these supported devices like you know, SD cards, flash, uh, you know, using SPI or NAND flash. Uh, and basically it runs a command line interface uh, over a serial port. And you know, people like us can load and boot a kernel possibly changing any of the parameters in there, you know, from the default to make it do what we want to do, kind of take over and give it our own instructions versus something that comes from the manufacturer. Um, you're also able to read device information, uh, read and write, flash memory, you know, download files. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can do with this. Uh, and, uh, you know, Basically, you can choose the memory locations of the kernel and, and other boot information and, and explicitly, you know, tell it, hey, I want to look at this destination and I'm going to copy this information. So it's it's really good at extracting data uh, and uh, pulling that out for further analysis, you know, outside of that U-boot connection. Uh, so it's loaded from flash memory. It's often accessible over a serial connection, and that's what we've used today is uh, we're using a Shikra, uh, uh, utilizing UART to connect to these devices. Um, it also comes with a limited set of commands. So there's a lot, several commands that we're gonna be going over uh, that come with UBoot. So moving on. So pin glitch, 
on the Philips Hue. So that's what we're going to be doing first. I'm going to get out of these slides. Boring, right? Let's get out of here. So we're going to go up to my other screen over here. And just to show you some of the devices we're working with, we got the, I'm looking all around me, it's right in front of me, the, <laughs> the Philips Hue. Uh, it's, it's basically, it's been stripped down. You know, I can see the, the underlying uh, form factor here, but, um, you know, this thing is to connect your, your lights in your house. So if you wanted to, you know, have a bunch of different colored lights and then control them from your phone, you'd buy one of these devices. So you could imagine a lot of people have these in their houses. Um, I think you can connect up to like 50 light bulbs with this thing. Um, and then we have the Luma, which is, looks like a little Wi-Fi access point or something like that, but it's exactly what it is. It's a mesh Wi-Fi access point. It's got ethernet on board. It's got a USB. Um, it's got a bunch of other stuff in there. You can't really see because camera's not very clear, but uh, that's what we're going to be breaking down today. So let me get my other situation going on here. And first off, got to set this up. So bear with me here. And if you already have questions, you know, don't hesitate. Throw them out there while I get this thing set up here. Okay, that's in there. Perfect. So just get some wires out of the way. I should remember that choice from last time. All good. So just to break down what is on this now. So we have the UART connection over here to my Shikra. Uh, we're using ground, uh, ground over here, receive and transmit over here. So we're, we're connected to some headers uh, that are on this, this motherboard. Uh, then we have another set of headers over here that's uh, set up for my ground out wire. So I have a wire that has a little paper clip shoved in the end of it uh, that we may be using to glitch this thing out. So that's a little bit about what's on this thing. You also have the uh, two flash chips that we're going to be looking at, this one down here and this other rectangular guy right here. So those are the two uh, chips that are communicating that we're going to be disrupting. Uh, so on the left-hand side, I have uh, a terminal called, uh, software called Cool Terminal. And it's free, you can download it. Uh, it's, it's pretty versatile on Mac from you know the few times that I've been using it here. And uh, so far, so good. Um, you can actually see when it's transmitting and receiving, you can see when it's connected. Um, a lot of good detail here. So I'm gonna disconnect and I'm gonna clear the data. And I'm also gonna look at these options. So there has been some things that we did prior to this call to kind of set this up for success. So I did change the port to my USB serial because we are using a Shikra. Uh, I did change the baud rate to 115, 200. Uh, and I also changed the, some of the terminal settings so that we can actually interact with this terminal and not pull our hair out because you can't backspace, you can't delete and things start getting crazy. You know, if I can't go backwards, then how can we go forwards? Uh, so a few of the options just wanted to, to highlight. Uh, so now that that's all said and done, let's get some power to this thing. So you can't see it, but I have a power strip with my uh, controlled by my foot over here. So let me just get power to this real quick. Okay, so we got power there. Got to take my shoe off because I can't do it with my shoe. I totally forgot I have to use my toe. <laughs> so all good. We're going to connect to this thing once we get some power on it. And we're in. So this is just the normal boot up of this device. We're just looking at it from a terminal perspective. Um, and, and with this, we can already get some good information, good value, because uh, we all know when things boot up, there's a lot of information that's kind of sprayed out there. And sometimes it's machine communication. Sometimes it's detailed information that we can actually use and take back and, you know, learn more about this system. So, you know, as it boots up, I think it takes about 32 seconds. So we're almost there. This is a seconds timer on the left-hand side, if that wasn't uh, clear. Um, so once we get to the login, I think it's, aha, so we're here. So there's the login. 
uh, prompt. I don't know the password. Uh, I tried to look it up and I didn't find it. Uh, let's see, roots, admin, just try one. All right, so it's not working. Okay, so we cannot log in at this stage. So let's take it to the motherboard, right? So I'm gonna clear this out. Okay, so we're gonna start fresh. I'm gonna turn the power on this guy. My trusty index toe, there it is. So I'm gonna clear it and we get my, my wire ready. Hopefully get this on the first shot here. So clear the data, we're connected. Power is on and that's the pin. Oh, I'm shaking. Oh, there it is, perfect. So we got the command line. So if you didn't see it, it was pretty quick, but there is a pin that I just lightly touched and pressed against this, uh, this little paperclip thing um, right in there. So if I can keep my hand steady, um, it's right around there. So that is what got us to this point. And what can we do here? So a few things. Uh, we can just ask for help. I, I mean, where are we? Um, help me. Uh, so we get a lot of different commands. Uh, you know, there's boot commands. There's echo commands. We can echo, echo arguments to the console. We can uh, loop, infinite loop on, a, on, a, on an address range. Uh, we can ping. You know, I think there's a ping option in here. Yeah, ping. So we can even try to connect to other network ho assets uh, you know, that may be able to communicate to this device if we want to. Uh, we can print the environment variables. We can set the environment variables, save the environment variables. So we, we have a lot of options here. Uh, we could even boot TFTP boot if we, if we wanted to. So a lot of different things we can see at this point. So we're just going to print the environment variables and see what else is in here. So these environment variables uh, are somewhat of the command and control area uh, of this device. So what we change in here does affect the entire system and the device. So, you know, we can see the baud rate there is set to 115200, which is how we're able to communicate. Uh, we see some more flash boot up details with the kernel. Uh, we also see some, uh, what else is in here? We got some version information, uh, production information. Oh, we got an IP address. So we got some IP information. We got a server IP information. A lot of information in here. Boot delay. Oh, that looks good. Uh, some security thing with a hash. That's probably something. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to just, so we don't have to do that ping glitch again. I'm just going to set the boot delay right now because I don't know about you, but my head got shaky hands and I don't want to have to do that every single time I reboot this thing. So we're going to set the environment variable uh, for boot delay to five seconds. Just to make sure that that held, we're going to check it again and it's there. So we got five seconds on that boot delay. We have to save it. Otherwise it just goes away. So we're going to save this. And that's all the jibber jabber of saving that environment. Let's just print it one more time for safekeeping. And boot delay is five, so we are there. So I'm just gonna reset, let this thing boot up again, except this time we should see a boot delay. Ah, there it is. So I am going to interrupt, rude, right? Uh, so now that we're back in, what else can we do with this thing? So let's take a look around back in those environment variables. And the one that kind of jumped out to me was the security and this weird hash following it. Um, 1984, maybe there's some type of underlying message in here, but the security is something we can mess with. So let's just set the environment of security to nothing. And nothing can be just two single ticks. Okay. So if I save that or set that, let's check it. Uh, ah, security equals nothing. Perfect. So we do need to make sure we save this, save environment. No matter what, you always have to save. So make sure that that's uh, 
you know, nailed down. Uh, and we'll just try resetting, see if that did anything for us. So essentially what the manufacturer did with this is they hard coded the password into the device. Not a good idea in my opinion, uh, but uh, that's what they did. And that's why we're able to uh, mess with it right now. Um, so we did let it go past the boot delay because we want to see what happens when it actually boots up now, because before we got hit with a login prompt and, and I didn't have the password, so we couldn't get anywhere with that. Uh, so as this thing kind of boots up, same kind of song and dance with the boot up information. Uh, you know, it's, it's writing, it's opening, it's loading, it's doing all these things. And, and any of those environments that we've changed may affect you know, this, this time right now. So if we just wait a few more seconds, the magic of television and we are root. So just by eliminating that environment variable security, it actually cleared out the password. And that was actually the password um, in a hash. So removing it gave us uh, root access. So right on high fives, air fives, you know, because the timing, but uh Air fives all around. We got this thing. So what can we do now? Um, well, lots of things. We can start looking at the mounted drives. Uh, we can dig into the root file system. We can look at the kernel, um, a bunch of different root drives in here. Uh, the root file system data drive. Maybe there's some good detail in there. Um, you know, we're, we're clearly at the helm here. We, you know, we clearly have the reins of this device now. Um, you know, we can look at other information on this thing and see if there's more details that we can pull out of it, more user details, maybe some hashes, who knows. But uh, we are in like Flynn here. So any questions on that so far? Hey, Garrett. Yeah, it looks like we have a couple of questions here cropping up. Um, so Strikeout looks like he's trying to do possibly some uh, – you boot bypass through glitching on a wise cam outdoor and um, this individual is asking, where did you actually put the paperclip out on the chip? Um, a data line? Yes. So that is a, it's a great question. It is a data line and it's in between these two flash chips on the, I don't know if I can get um, a better view of this thing, but um, uh, that's looking terrible. Uh, so I can't, I don't have a micro, uh, uh, I don't have a magnifier to get you a better view of this, but basically there is a pin in between the two chips that is sending data. Um, it's basically this pin right here. It's a little silver flat pin there. Uh, and if you look close on the motherboard, you can see the, the tracks going between those chips. You can kind of see it, but now it's all blurry. Course. Come on. Yeah, to kind of add to that, this is Daryl, uh, real quick. Um, often, uh, one of the best thing to do is once you've identified the flash chips uh, that you're going to attempt this on, is to uh, track down the data sheets uh, on those. And from the data sheets, uh, in this particular case, I traced out the uh, data zero line. Um, so. Um, it, between those two chips, uh, this particular glitch is a little easier uh, timing-wise because uh, the the small uh, the smaller chip that's toward the bottom actually has uh, U-boot on it. The other chip has the kernel on it. Uh, so the goal is to find the data line for uh, the chip containing a kernel um, and interrupt that uh, by taking it to ground. Uh, and the, uh, the, the attempt there is, is you boots load it. And before it has a chance to actually load the kernel or call the kernel, uh, you literally, uh, take one of those data lines to ground, causing it to, uh, fail to read it as, uh, as Garrett was talking about and as he showed there. So. Awesome. Uh, one other question here, Garrett, that is cropping up. Um, individual asks, uh, what type of device are you using to interact with uh, with the device here uh, via UART? Are you using something like a Shikra? 
Yeah, let me show you. I can show you what that is here. Um, we got one right here to show you. So let me kill out this thing real quick. So we're going to disconnect. I'll pull this thing right out of my laptop for you. Full power. All right, so to give you a better idea of what this thing is, is it's basically just a little USB with a, a chip attached to it uh, with several different header connections on it. Um, it comes with a, a data sheet that kind of breaks down what these connectors are, but that's literally all it is. It has three cables. I don't know where my camera is. <laughs> it's got three cables, one for ground, one for uh, receive and transmit. So that's, that's how I'm connected directly uh, to this device. Hopefully that, uh, that helps. But but you can pick these things up off like uh, off the internet. I think they're thirty or forty bucks. I can't remember how much they cost, but they're they're doable. Uh, and there's some other devices out there like uh, uh, Pirate. Uh, there's one called I think UART Pirate or something like that, or Pirate Bay. I can't remember what the name of it is, but uh, there's several tools out there that do the same, essentially the same thing. This is just the one that, that we use today. Cool. That's the, uh, I think the last of the queue of questions that we have here. Bus pirate, I think was the word you're looking for. That's what it was. Bus pirate. <laughs> oh man. Yep. I knew it was like something pirate. to do with the pirates. <laughs> pirate would be pretty good too, though. I, I like to ring for that. <laughs> right on. Cool. Well, let me, uh, if that's all the questions, let me just get back to the slides here and move on. So now we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to be going over some common problems with uh, embedded devices and then using Uboop to solve them. So I'm going to switch gears and pass it over to my colleague, Daryl Highland, and take it away from there. So let me just stop my share. Thanks, Garrett. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, so uh, kind of get back to um, the actual hue. So uh, I went and configured this, this hue to kind of exhibit some of the a, a common problem that you will offer and encounter and I know uh, I've hit it two or three times working on IOT gear in the last uh, year or so and I know um, Jonathan has also encountered it uh, and again this is this is here is just a standard hue um, and then this here happens to be a, a quad UART uh, device I kind of like this one it's a little different than the Shikra this one actually takes four different UARTs and you can switch by between three and a half and four volts and it's all USB based. So uh, it's kind of, uh, kind of sweet. I like using that uh, if I need multiple UARTs at the same time. Uh, sometimes but let's go ahead and plug this device in, make sure everything's going to come up here. Um, so again, uh, often when you're encountering devices, um, they'll come up. And if you notice it had the uh, boot delay, I put the boot delay on here just to avoid having the glitch again. Um, but the uh, pin glitch to force into a U-boot console is uh, a literally very common method. But as you see, we hit a point here where it's literally disabled. We no longer have a console. Uh, and this is not uncommon. Uh, you'll have a device where you're actually able to uh, establish a um, UART connection on the device uh, and start seeing it boot up. And then inevitably when it's booted up, there's literally uh, no console whatsoever uh, on that device. I've had it go up to this point. You'll see console disabled. I've seen it come up and not tell me console disabled, just say loading kernel. And then you see nothing after that. So whether you use a ping glitch or they've enabled the, uh, uh, the boot delay or some method you can gain access to it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go through that. And often uh, the fix for this is, uh, is typically very simple. Um, let's see if I can catch this here. Okay. 
um, actually, which is funny, uh, that did not work for me. So um, we'll see. This is going to be funny if this doesn't work. It wouldn't surprise me if Zoom uh, caused the problem. Because, uh, <laughs> okay, we're able to get into it. So uh, back to those uh, common commands that uh, Garrett had mentioned, like print environment. So we're going to come over here and print environment. And again, there's literally uh, tons of environment variables. Uh, a lot of these environment variables are part of the boot process, like Garrett said. Some of these actually pass commands to the kernel. Um, so the kernel knows what to do as it's loaded up. Um, and often where you see alterations uh, that need to be made, uh, the most common one is boot args. Uh, you'll see boot args showing the configurations, but when we come over here, we see boot args console um, is actually set normal. So maybe it's somewhere else, but here we found out they have another uh, environment variable called standard boot args. So apparently this is what's being called uh, at some point. Uh, thus we see the null uh, taking place in here. Uh, sometimes this will involve very experimental. Um, first time uh, when I was setting this up to identify it, that's when I found out that this boot arc segment doesn't work, uh, and then you need to do it some other way. Uh, and then turns out it was the standard boot arcs. So to go ahead and do this, uh, again, like you did, you go, you set the environment, um, which was uh, standard STD um, boot arcs. Something always to uh, remember also. In this case, I'm going to rewrite the entire one and we're gonna set the console here. And look at our standard boot args. Make sure there's not another one. Uh, you would be surprised how many times I've uh, misspelled something um, and it's easy to do. And what you end up doing is just creating another argument that isn't read by the system or used. Uh, so then you boot the system and it goes, well, it didn't fix anything. What went wrong? Uh, often it's just a typo. Uh, you've seen where people have made typos up here. Here's an example, security, security. Uh, that's kind of weird. Uh, so again, that's uh, probably a typo uh, that took place there. So at this point, we'll go ahead and go save environment variables. Write the environment variables back out. And then uh, the reset command will cause the CPU to reset on the device from the uh, U-Boot console. Um, so let's see if this will actually work. Um, uh, and it's kind of amazing uh, out of the... Um, number of times I've done this, more than three quarters of the time uh, when the device did boot up. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, we seem to have a crash on the system. <laughs> we had a kernel panic. That's interesting. So demos do go bad, so uh, we will see what we have here. If this doesn't come up, um, we're probably just going to move on. Um, typically, um, you make these changes on the system. Um, yep, we got another kernel panic. I'm going to take one more check. Let's see what corrupted. see what we have here and that's yeah that's correct so um, we're not going to waste much time on this and we're just going to move on uh, typically uh, there may be something in here sometimes these things go bad but normally just by fixing the console setting uh, for some reason my kernel's messed up uh, I'm not sure how that happened maybe from constantly rebooting this thing over and over and over uh, Maya finally said, hey, I'm not going to play anymore, corrupted something. Uh, but typically, when you go into um, the U-Boot uh, console and you've broke into it and you have a device that will not give you a console after boot up, 
uh, a lot of times you can go in here and alter either boot args or some other uh, reference that's used for the boot arguments that tell the kernel what console, what bald rate, all those typical things, uh, and set that and it'll come up. Um, usually three quarters of the time when I've encountered this on commercial gear where they've actually turned the console off trying to hide access, uh, when I do allow it to boot up, it's giving me root access from the very get-go uh, versus giving me a password uh, prompt. Uh, it's giving me uh, root access. So uh, again, the best way to do this is check the console settings, uh, make sure they're correct, um, make sure uh, they haven't uh, turned uh, initialization uh, init off. I've seen this messed with, which would cause uh, weird things in killing consoles and stuff like that. But typically, nine times out of 10, it's literally going to be the console setting. Uh, if it's not set, often when you identify the processor that may be used in this case, you can do a little uh, Google reference and identify the, the most common TTY setting uh, for that. Uh, a lot of times it's in the data sheet and stuff like that to identify how it is naming its primary console uh, TTY. So often data sheets, a little Google on the device or the processor in case to be able to identify that. And that helps you to uh, literally set the console where it actually needs to be. So unfortunately that demo failed, even though it's worked 40 times up till today. Uh, and I will stop sharing and turn this over to Garrett so he can uh, attempt his next demo. Um, is there any questions related to this uh, particular failure? Uh, um, let's see. It looks like there's a couple folks that are uh, helping to troubleshoot, and I, I saw one of the issues too. I think um, I guess it uh, looks like boot args was double set. Um, also, the board equals uh, appeared to be missing. The boot args, I think for sure, might have been one of them. Um, the board equals might take a little troubleshooting, but uh, that's a couple questions I guess that came up. But another. Oh yeah, got it right there. I see it. Yep. Yeah. Good, good catch, guys. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's, often it's when you're uh, uh, cutting and pasting, it's very diff difficult to do that. Since I didn't define the board, that obviously called it. So good catch out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, props uh, to folks on uh, t uh, Twitch as well as uh, here in the uh, panel as well that uh, kind of caught that. But there is a, a couple questions that did crop up. Uh, one individual asks, how often do you find um, that IoT devices are actually using U-Boot? Like, would you say about 75%, 50%? I'd have to say it's still probably um, a little higher than 50% that I engage devices that U-Boot used. Um, now, if they're running the latest version of U-Boot, this typical ping glitch will not work. Um, so uh, what happens is the newer version of U-Boot that is out there, if anyone is actually using it, it is supposed to, when it can't learn, the, uh, it can't load the kernel, will actually restart the U-Boot process. So it'll just go into a, an infinite loop until it can load the kernel uh, in that case there. And that's how they kind of started to fix this problem. I assure you there's probably uh, attack methods in that case with that to get around of it. Uh, but the best fix, uh, what we always recommend to most vendors on how do you solve the problem um, with U-Boot being an issue is start using Secure Boot. Um. That actually uh, answers the um, last question that I had here was, what's the best way of overcoming some of these issues? And it sounds like Secure Boot's the best method for that. Yeah, I would say uh, Secure Boot is the best best solution to these issues that we're we're running through today. And I think we had another question just popped up here that we can kind of squeeze in before we uh we move on because there's one more demo. Is that correct, Garrett? Yeah, yeah, we still got one more, but uh, yeah, more questions, the more the merrier. Okay, yeah. So Asher asks, do you know why sometimes the environment variables cannot be modified even with root access to the U-Boot console? This apparently has happened for this individual. Uh, the only thing I can think of off the top of my head is that the manufacturer hard set some of those environment variables to not allow change even at a root level. Um, or there's just some underlying permissions that, you know, even though we may feel we're, we're root, there may be some 
hard coded uh just permission set there that, that we just can't get into i don't know maybe someone else has more to speak on that but that, that's just my initial gut feeling i, I can that has i'd yeah. have to agree with that uh, i actually had a device i was playing with the other day and there was probably uh, a half dozen arguments uh in the environment variables uh that when i changed them and saved them they always they never save nothing um so U-Boot's a funny beast. Um, everybody compiles it differently. So uh, the amount of features, functions, capabilities, and how it works is very configurable. Uh, and every vendor will compile it and use it different. Uh, also, I've seen some where uh, boot args and all of those settings are not even used by the kernel. Um, that stuff is actually hard coded into some kernel configurations. Uh, so alterations with uh, boot args um, don't actually uh, work, um, which can be problematic too when you're trying to carry out uh, some level of tax. That uh, based on that, I think what um, Garrett's going to uh, demo here just shortly uh, will actually open up some other possible uh, opportunities. Um, if you're uh, able to break in uh, to the U-Boot console, uh, some of the stuff he's going to show may be very helpful in um, gaining a level of access into the system. Awesome. Any other uh, questions out there, John? I think we're caught up on the queue. I think we're good to go. All right. Right on. Moving on. So... Um, Next, next, we're going to be going over the Luma. The the Luma is that mesh device uh, that we were looking at. Um, it's a lot. It's got a little bit more to it uh, on the motherboard itself. Um, you know, it's there. There's just a lot more going on. It has onboard Ethernet. It's got a USB port. It's got several different places to connect wires. There's some headers. Uh, a lot of stuff going on. I think it's got like a built-in Wi-Fi chip on it, possibly. I'm not sure, but uh, a lot of stuff going on there. So we're going to boot to root here real quick out of this slides back into the live action. Here we go. So now I got my Luma set up here, broken down, ripped it apart. Um, I've got my my UART connection over here with my ground, my, my receive and my transmit. We're all good. Um, I have my Ethernet actually plugged in because uh, I'm just going direct line to this thing. Um, and then I also have a ground wire that you can't really see, but uh, there is a ground wire um, soldered onto the board over here. So uh, the way that I did get into this thing initially was a pin glitch. Uh, and I'm not going to show that today, but um, if it's something you want to see, I can demo it later if we have time. But basically this particular chip right here is the the chip that we are compromising to, to break into this thing. Um, and it's actually this pin right here, this data pin right over here, the second one up. I don't know if you can even see that, but uh, there's eight pins around that square chip. And, and we're, we're going to short the data line or the data uh, pin on that thing. So that's how we would have got into this thing. But since we already did that the magic of television we're just going to plug some power into this thing okay we got power now and a little bit more slack in that line the trusty toe come on toe there it is and we're connected and there it goes so what's funny about uh cool term is you have these receive and transmit lights going on in the bottom so we know that we're getting data in some way, somehow. Uh, and again, with the boot up process, a lot of information here, you know, and obviously we can all read extremely fast. That's how we're able to read everything that's coming down the screen. No, probably not. There's, there's ways to extract this if you wanted to kind of, if you recorded this and just played it back slow, um, you could be taking like screenshots as it goes through. There's, there's plenty of ways to kind of extract everything that's going on here. Um, this one actually takes a little bit longer to boot up than the Hue. I think just because it has more functionality to it. It's not just going to turn your lights blue or, or green or red or whatever the ambiance for the evening happens to be. 
uh, this time it's actually going to provide internet connection. So when people come over or you have, you know, parties, not so much anymore, but when we did, uh, you want to have everyone be able to have internet. You know, we got to be staying up to date on our, on our socials. We got to be, uh, you know, staying up to date on everything. So uh, internet is good. Um, so we may not wait for this whole thing to boot up. I think it takes about a couple minutes and my patience is weak. So as this thing kind of rounds the bend here, it looks like it's doing stuff with Wi-Fi. Uh, looks like some connections were going on, some different channels. Um, let's just see what happens. Oh, okay. So we got a login prompt. Uh, we can try to log in. I don't know the password though. Um, let's give it a shot anyway. Login incorrect. So no, no luck again. We're we're over two there uh, on trying to just log into these things. Uh, so what can we do? We're just gonna power cycle this thing. All right, so clear, clear. All right, pinky toe in action. All right, so like I said before, the uh, you know how the cooking shows do it. They they don't cook that whole turkey right in front of you. That'd be crazy, but uh, they have one already in the oven. So that's kind of what happened here. Is is I pin glitch this thing prior to this call so that I did set this boot delay so that I could break out of it and get in there and actually show you some stuff. So um, similar to before, print environment variables. We could just ask for help though, just see what's different about the Luma versus the the Hue. Um, so some slight differences. Uh, this one's not as long as far as the list of items that we can do. Um, so just kind of piggybacking on that that final question before is, you know, U-Boot is configured differently on every device, or essentially it can be. Um, so I was even reading up on this company called uh, Emac. I think they do like uh, SCADA devices. And the way that they configure U-Boot was completely different than another person who configured U-Boot because I was when I was looking things up on this uh, on this stuff I, I would find several different explanations like well wait a minute is this even the same thing like yeah it is it's just can be completely configured you know in several different ways uh, or compiled I guess is the right word to use so if we look at some of these things uh, what jumps out to me is the boot arguments, the boot IPQ, boot from a flash device, boot from memory, boot from a, a network connection using TFTP. Uh, spoiler alert, maybe. Uh, we got uh, ping, so we can actually test ping connections. Uh, print environment, like we already know. Save environment, set environment, that's all there. Uh, print the uh, the memory flash information. Uh, there's a TFTB boot command right there. And, oh, and a USB boot. So a lot of stuff. This thing has a USB onboard. So you know, there's more opportunities here. Um, so today, let's get back into the print environment. Let's take a look back at this. Today we already have set the boot delay. So that's already done. Boot delay is set. Um, this boot command though is set to that boot IPQ. And if you don't remember, we can just quickly look back at that boot IPQ. What, what the heck is that? Uh, so oh, here it is, boot IPQ. And it's to boot from flash device. So that's what it's set out of the box from the manufacturer there. So if we get back into those environment variables, what else can we mess with? Uh, let's see, so IP address, ah. IP address is important. And we also have server IP. So what can we do with those? So basically this IP address, this, this Luma device does not have networking configured out of the box. So when it turns on, it just has a random IP in there. Uh, and I just set it to an available IP on the network that isn't already being used by like the Xbox or the PlayStation or the, the 10 Raspberry Pis or the, the N64, you know what I'm saying, all these devices out here. So I just chose a random IP, doesn't doesn't really matter. Um, what does matter is the server IP. The server IP is going to be the TFTP server. So we're gonna be using TFTP uh, to boot this thing or to boot from TFTP. 
uh, and that's where this extra server comes into play. So I got my uh, just a Ubuntu 16.04, just fresh ISO. I just pulled down the other day um, and just found a couple articles online on how to set up a TFTP server. It's really straightforward. It, you know, if I can do it, I'm sure anybody on the call can do it because it's uh, just creating a file, setting the right parameters in that file, and then making sure the service is up and running. I can't tell you how much pain I was having to literally yesterday about trying to get this thing to work and literally I didn't really change much and it just started working again. So we're going to see how, uh, how well today goes, but um, anyway, it looks like it's up and running. We can just see if this is still good to go. All oh, the passwords, super secret. All right. So we're still running as of 1529. So right on, to, right on schedule there. Um, cool. And if we look at the IP of this device, that might help, right? I have config, uh, let's see. So this is 192.168.118. So that's where that IP comes into play. All right, cool. So jumping back to this now. So this boot command is set to this. We can actually override this particular boot command here and these boot arguments. Um, Sorry, there might be a neighbor calling for their cat. Uh, so <laughs> I've actually already gone ahead and wrote out this command just for sake of typoing this thing a million times. Uh, I'm just going to copy it over. And if you notice, I didn't show it actually, but if I go back to my VM, um, I have a kernel image over here that has been compiled uh, using OpenWRT. So it's, uh, this is the package or the, the image that we're going to be calling from my TFTP server. So I just dropped it on the, um, the desktop here. I have it in several locations just because I was testing. So um, I think it just needs to be on the root drive, just accessible. Uh, so good stuff there. Um, and now that we're back here, I'm just going to paste this command. Cool, just like that. So I'm using uh, TFTP boot, which is one of those uh, help arguments. If you remember, there was a TFTP boot argument that we could use. And then I'm telling it, which piece of memory do I want to boot from? And I want to boot this particular image and then boot at this particular address in memory. So that's what this command is meant to do. So without further ado, let's see how it goes. Let's just hit the big red button. And right away, you can see that it's using an Ethernet device, ETH0. Uh, so it is connected. It's from the server, my TFTP server at 1.18, and then from our address, which is .25. So looks like we might be in good shape here on the first go around. How about that? Looks like it's uncompressing the kernel image. It's booting it up. You can see the open WRT right here if you catch it. Um, and then it's off to the races. So as this thing kind of boots up, we'll see if we got any further than that login prompt uh, that we had before. Um, and if you're not familiar with the open WRT, it is open source. Um, and those can also be kind of compiled a little bit differently depending on um, you know, what you want to do with it. So um, by the way, the devices, if you wanted to buy these devices, very cheap on eBay. Uh, you can pick them up here, uh, very cheap. You just search eBay. But this OpenWRT, it's it's basically just an open source project that that you can compile different uh, uh, you know different things and and connect to different devices. It's just fully customizable. Um, so that's a little bit about what's going on there. Uh, let's see. So as this thing kind of boots up, let's see if we just hit one of these random buttons over here. Boom. So that did it. We are in a built-in shell on the Luma device. So this technically is not the Luma OS. So I want to be clear on that. We didn't just root the whole Luma device. What we did is we created a kind of a landing place or um, 
uh, kind of like a, before the OS hits the, the ground, we created our own OS and say, hey, we want to boot to our OS before you even get to yours. Okay, so that's what this is. And so it's not the direct file system on the Luma. But we can still do things similar to the Hue, where, where we can, you know, dig into the root file system. We can look at the kernel, the firmware. There's a lot of things that we can potentially get into. Um, there's several different techniques to do that. Uh, one of them would be mounting these drives. So assuming that we had full permission, uh, then we would just mount these drives and start extracting data from there. Um, if we don't, you know, in a situation where we don't have access, say like for right now, like we have all zeros here. So it's possible that we don't have access to this right now. So what we could do is use something like DD uh, to extract the data that way. It's a command line tool or something like TFTP and, and just siphon the data to another medium and then perform, you know, additional analysis there. But um, as far as from where we are right here, there are some things that we can do, but it is kind of in this open WRT console now where we'd have to get a little bit creative and kind of use our, our noggins and uh, find another path to the Luma OS, but it's possible. So that's a little bit about what we got going on on this thing. Uh, we wanted to show, you know, booting to an OS that we compiled on the device itself. Um, so that's a little bit about what we got going on here. Um, any questions on how we got to this point? Yep, uh, a couple questions here. Let me take a look. Uh, one individual asks, uh, I assume all of these attacks require physical access. There's no way of performing this attack um, uh, remotely. Is that correct? Yes. So unfortunately, if you did want to you know, start doing some war driving or something or mess with your family members, whatever. Uh, it's all ethical, right? Uh, you know, you would have to have physical access to these devices. I imagine you could get physical access one time and then set up some type of logic bomb or some type of, you know, hook into the device so that if it were online, it could call to us in some way or somehow. Um, probably some of the devices that have internet connection more so than, than not, but... Um, uh, I know that I have the, the, the light bulbs from Costco. I think they're called, uh, oh man, now I'm drawing a blank on it, but it's basically the same thing as the Philips Hue, uh, and it's the Costco version. I can't remember the name of it now. I'm going to drive me nuts, but basically they were on the internet and they didn't have very much, uh, any security and, I was just afraid to even mess with it at that point. I'm like, man, it's on the network. I'm just going to take it off. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you, you do have to have physical access to this thing, but, um, you know, uh, you never know. So good question. All right. Uh, taking a look at another question here. Um, as far as, uh, I, I think this was touched on a little bit earlier as well um, by Daryl, but how do you know which pin to take to ground when glitching? Um, I know earlier we were talking about uh, data zero, data one, but as far as uh, testing is concerned, uh, how would you know about taking which pin to ground whenever you're performing this type of glitching? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I do have the breakdown of that flash chip on another screen somewhere, somehow. Um, bear with me. Can you still see my screen? Is it still showing uh, questions? Yes. Okay, give me one second, and I can get that uh, that readout for you. But basically, it is a it is a data line, and it is a. Uh, the one that we would want to break into. So when you look at the data sheets for these devices, um, you do want to look for the data lines is kind of the idea and finding out where those actually exist. Um, let's see if I can't let's see if I can't get a good shot of this. Give me one second. Um, okay. Got that now. Let's just minimize some things. Okay, so 
Let's see if I can't get a better view of this device here. Okay, so if you can still see my screen, what I have on there now is basically the top-down view of that exact uh, chip. So if I look back to the camera, um, this is the chip breakdown, this one right here. I don't know if you can see that, but the one with the little orange paint drop. Um, so that's what we're breaking down in this diagram here. Um, if I can get my pen out, there we go. So the line that we're shorting is this SO line. Um, this this SO line over here, that's the uh, data line. Um, I can't remember exactly what it stands for. Maybe, maybe Daryl remembers, but uh, uh, that's essentially what we're shorting in this uh, in this example. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's also an interesting question that came up when glitching. Wouldn't it be a little safer to use a resistor in lieu of a paper clip? <laughs> uh, there's a possibility you could short a 3.3 or 5 volt trace pin and burn a register. Yeah, there's always a chance. Um, uh, that's why it's very important to. Um, uh, I'm not against using a resistor. I mean, there is some value to that. Um, if. Uh, uh, you'd have to experiment around uh, because obviously you want to interrupt the data uh, significantly enough um, and a resistor may or may not drop the voltage enough based on the resistor size. But uh, in, in reference to doing that, again, like he's showing here, go ahead and get the data sheets, figure out what you're grounding out. Uh, so literally you don't like just smoke something to randomly go into a device here and go, oh, I think I'll just start grounding stuff out. Uh, it's almost a guarantee uh, that you will brick the device permanently. Um, now I've had uh, on these glitching attacks, uh, probably successful. Uh, anytime there's two chips used where, uh, where you boot is on one chip and the kernel file systems on another, I've had a hundred percent success every time in actually doing that. Uh, I've only had a problem on one device uh, and it was using, I can't remember the chip it was using. Uh, it was very much more high speed. So getting it at the right time was uh, difficult. Uh, we never destroyed the chip, but during the attack, even though I was taking the data line down the ground, uh, I ended up actually um, causing it to, uh, screw the U-boot up uh, and it actually damaged the U-boot uh, so that the uh, chip would not uh, boot up anymore. It would come up actually giving you an error in the U-boot. Now how it altered part of the data in the U-boot during this process, I have no clue. Maybe it did fry register in there or uh, smoke something, uh, but we were able to pull the chip and then successfully pull the entire operating system off and recover it all anyway. So problem solved yeah yeah and just to speak on that note too uh, i've definitely broken enough devices just tinkering just like that and not really looking you know doing the right uh, diligence of looking at the data sheet looking at what am i actually messing with it was more like if so it works in the movies so this is how it works in real life you know i'm just going to touch a bunch of stuff and now i'm in um, so I definitely have a bunch of devices that uh, just are paperweights around, scattered around. <laughs> so, uh, but, that's, but yeah, that's that's funny, dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good stuff. So that is getting into the Luma uh, and being able to boot up, you know, another operating system such as OpenWRT. So if those devices aren't readily available to you, like the Philips Hue and the Luma, things like this, or they're the ones that you use in your house and you're not trying to lose internet in your house, totally get that. Um, but if you have a Pi laying around, you can do the same exercise with a Raspberry Pi. Uh, there's several articles uh, uh, you know, over the internet that you can find how to do this, how to set it up, what you can do with it, and it's it's pretty wide. Uh, so this is just an example of a Raspberry Pi that we had connected 
one of my colleagues set up uh, for me for this demo. So um, then you have U-Boot going on on the right hand side. It's it's doing the same kind of song and dance of getting into, uh, you know, the, the flash memory, the kernel, and actually printing the environment variables so that we can tweak them and adjust them and then tell it what we want it to do. So it's just another example uh, of a Raspberry Pi. Uh, cool. So that is all, folks. I really appreciate everyone who was able to join this session on a Saturday when we're not in Vegas. I'm, I'm assuming we're not in Vegas, but um, normally uh, hungover at this time of the day and, you know, completely... <laughs> you know con funk is in full force uh you know i don't know what time it is i don't know where i am that's normally the status of this day for me so uh so it's, it's a little bit of different uh, doing this thing virtual so i appreciate everyone who's able to to join and all the questions and um you know really happy happy to be here so if you have any other questions throw them out there um uh, but uh, that's the end of the show yeah, there was one more question I saw come in in the chat, um, and it said, "Did you download someone else's build um, for the Luma, or did you do it yourself?" Uh, in this particular case, uh, this build was—I uh, actually built this uh, a while back while I was doing some testing on the uh, Luma. So uh, I used uh, OpenWRT's uh, program. This is built off uh, an IPQ40 series processors, which is what the processor is on that particular Luma. And it's one of the chipsets that's actually supported um, within the OpenWRT. Now, in this particular case, uh, the success of this wasn't 100%. As Garrett pointed out, that the uh, root FS was showing um, nothing there or zero location. And the reason why that is, is because remember, this is a two chip system. Um, and when you're building um, an actual firmware package, you have to build out a device tree. Um, now, most of uh, m most of all of the data available on OpenWRT uh, was very uh, well available dealing with one chip environments. Uh, but uh, the second uh, device or the device tree for the second chip has not been built into this yet, which uh, potentially made uh, that an issue. Um, but once you compile it and compile it with the right uh, complete device tree complete it, then when he showed with uh, PROC MTD, uh, which is the uh, memory technology devices, it's kind of an abstract layer between the hardware, the physical flash hardware and the other part, you can literally from those uh, potentially mount those file systems up or you can also DD them off by actually calling them directly through uh, dev uh, MTD zero through nine or 10, which is one of the methods that's really easy once you get some kind of console, which would be the ultimate goal of bringing in a, a new kernel via TFTP, because you would come in, it would uh, have the device tree, you would see the chips, uh, even though they're not mounted up, you can easily DD all of those images off their file system, the root file system, uh, and everything from a, uh, a separate booted kernel like this, uh, giving you the ability to uh, do some offline um, uh, bin walk and extract the data, hopefully find the root. Or inevitably, you could EV even, uh, when you find the root, you could easily, in this particular case, DD it off, explode it out, uh, and then um, alter it, rebuild it, repack it back in, and then DD it back over that partition area, uh, and then reboot the device, uh, and in that fashion actually change the root password. So this particular attack, as he addressed and talked about, will really open up a lot of new avenues to uh, some hardened devices, but it all comes down to can you get access to that U-Boot console? And, and also... Uh, the uh, the presentation or uh, the demo I ran uh, and the person pointed out where I missed board. That was correct. As soon as we jumped off and he moved on, I went ahead and fixed that uh, typo, uh, failed to copy and reboot it, and it came up to uh, the root prompt. So uh, that worked out pretty good. So good shout out to that person was able to visually uh, quickly capture the idea that I missed that little piece. So totally cool. Nice. 
Yeah, and I wanted, I just wanted to add on that. Sometimes on the devices, if you can still see my screen, the uh, uh, the prompt, the command prompts on the Luma is actually the name of the chip, the IPQ40. So sometimes you can get even more details from just the device itself, just telling you like, hey, this is what I am. Hope this helps, you know. Uh, but, but yeah, I just wanted to call that out. I didn't mention it earlier, but IPQ40, like what the heck is that? It's the name, it's the type of uh, chipset uh, that's on this thing, uh, the type of processor. So cool. Um, well, really appreciate everyone. If that's all the questions, uh, not sure if there's any more, but we're good to go we're right on time. Yeah, Jonathan, do you see anything else on the Twitch we might have missed? Uh, taking a look here, I do see that in Zoom. Someone asks, it looks like it identified the attached flash as well. So I guess from the uh, the U boot output there, it identifies the flash. Um, pulling up Twitch, I think from Twitch we're also good to go. So the last question I guess was there in, in and um, uh, the question was, it looks like it identified the type of flash, um, and that might be kind of equally a statement as it is a question. It did. It it identified the uh, one of the flash chips. Um, so um, it, it, could you actually, from that booted kernel, potentially get to those current chips? Yeah, it's highly possible. Uh, even even um, you may have to do some manipulation. I haven't tried it yet, um, but typically the easiest way is to build it into the uh, device tree for the kernel that you're uh, building for that processor. That's the most effective way. Once that's built in there, uh, it makes it 10 times easier for gaining access and and basically uh, altering this data or extracting that data off there versus um, not necessarily uh, have to figure out how do I access a chip when I don't have a device tree for it. It's going to be very difficult. So, yeah. Sorry, I had someone that was playing the uh, uh, Lincoln Park at the full uh, full capacity of the volume there. So I apologize as that drove by. <laughs> okay, yeah, you have one. You have one person out there who says uh, you need to put that cowboy hat on behind you, uh, so you look <laughs> like uh, Billy Ray Cyrus. <laughs> put <his> hat on. <laughs> oh, y'all cracking me up. Oh man. I appreciate y'all, yeah. Let's we'll see what we got. Here we go. Hats on. <laughs> we have to take this off. But, but there we go. We're we're locked and loaded now. Pretty great. This is how you find the real bones. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the people in the audience, unless the uh, presenters need to leave, we still have time for more questions. Um, there's no rush to, to close out quite yet. Um, there's uh, 30 minutes before our next, next talk comes on. So we still have just a little bit of time. Probably we could do another five minutes if the presenters um, are still available. Hey, let me go ahead and uh, let me let me go ahead and boot my failure. <laughs> So let's switch over to that. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's get that going. Okay, hopefully everyone can see everything fine now. Uh, so let's go ahead and power this. Watch this thing fail again. I should know. I should know when to walk away uh, to a demo failure. So let's go ahead and stop here real quick. Uh, let's go print environment. Uh, so we can see what I altered. So I altered standard boot. Uh, when I copied it over, I missed this word right here, board equals. So it ended up uh, specifying this board. And what's kind of strange is often uh, when you do boot args, uh, and I've mistyped things before, uh, I've never had it cause a kernel panic like that before. So it's kind of interesting. I've had it just... Uh, skip over that functionality or whatever. So that was kind of interesting. So um, the change I did, this originally said null. 
we were able to uh, identify with a little legwork, watching the system normally boot up, uh, looking at some of that stuff, identify the type of TTY, and replace the console null out of there. So. So it's common to see these options also on devices uh, that are outside of the U-boot where it says press F key, enter into fail safe mode. Sometimes these will put you into a single user mode when uh, the vendor's crazy enough to leave them available. Um, something to think about from uh, when you're watching a boot option, it's not part of the U-boot stuff, but it can be very helpful. It will put you in a very locked down system. There won't be network, there won't be device drivers, there won't be nothing on there. Um, so inherently, there you go. So uh, instantly you're able to get past that. And like I said, this is kind of a common uh, issue. Um, that you can run into uh, a number of times where they've just basically said, turn the console off before you boot kernel or turn the console off when kernel, uh, before kernel runs. Uh, and because of that, you don't get a console. If you can gain access to U-boot, probably eight out of 10 times, you can change those settings um, to be able to gain access to a console. Now, whether you'll have full root access after boot, uh, is to be uh, found or figured out. Uh, but uh, believe it or not, I think over the last so many years, I've encountered three or four devices that had it set up to um, go ahead and uh, halt the console so you didn't have it. And when I changed the argument so the console was enabled, at least half the time I had a full uh, root console at that point. Uh, and these settings here that I mentioned, um, uh, the, the press one, two to select a debug mode. Uh, never had much luck with those. Sometimes they do things, sometimes they don't. But the F key, if you ever see that, takes you into sail, fail safe mode. This will give you root level access, uh, but it's amazing how complicated uh, with root level access and no ability to move data on or out of the device. Uh, it's doable, uh, but it becomes very problematic because often you actually have to build the device nodes. Uh, and if they harden the device and turn certain programs off and remove them, it becomes more difficult. Uh, from the Luma, just out of curiosity, from the Luma, uh, this had this, and I would work in to try to get data off of it. And the way I originally did it was go into the F mode uh, and actually build, uh, manually build all the device, not totally manually but uh, very close to manually reconstruct uh, the device nodes, um, naming them all the correct pieces and parts to build a USB. Uh, and then from there was able to move the data off to the USB. Uh, just some stuff to think about. Small question just came up, Daryl. I know you had mentioned this uh, yesterday during your building the IoT lab. Uh, what is your FTDI device that you're using for that one? Um, its name escapes me. Someone was asking on Twitch. Oh gosh, this one I have right here. Yeah, it was that cool one that could do like more than just it had like it supported like SPI and others in addition to UART. Come on over here. Uh... Yeah, that's the one. Let's power this thing off. Let's see if this has this name has a name on it. I don't know if this even has a name. It's very generic, and I do not even have the box for it anymore. Uh, I bought this off Amazon. All I did was search for um, multi UART connector or um, multi port UART connector, and this came up. If I remember, the price of this was uh, like twenty seven dollars. Um, but to to the life of me, I do not know the name. Uh, this is generic uh, generic build device coming out of China, um, and it works pretty good. So. Cool. But uh, um, sadly, I do not know what its name is or who makes it. Gotcha. Um, another question cropped up. Um, is there a URL or GitHub of some type where one could get ROMs to access a processor or access uh, to a processor to play around with and do this type of stuff? 
I, I think they're asking, um, is there, I guess, any like, uh, I, I guess, uh, I think, I think what's being asked with it is, are there maybe like a list of, of uh, devices that, that could be purchased in order to uh, do things such as U-boot exploitation? Uh, I would actually literally exactly what Garrett said, go to, um, go on to um, eBay and look at buying uh, some of the devices on eBay, um, I think would be bright. You get the Lumos, uh, you can get the, um, uh, you can go ahead and get the Hughes out there. He actually had a screen where he was showing some that were available. Uh, they're in, not expensive. Uh, I'm not sure how this would work. This is a product that, that I was playing around with just recently and it's like 19 or 20 bucks. And basically it has uh, OpenWRT running on it right now. Uh, has serial connections. Um, there's a flash chip, so you can practice pulling the chip off if you want reading it uh, or using SPI chip reading techniques. Uh, you can probably trace out uh, versus some of these headers or connectors. You may be able to trace out um, the actual um, JTAGs on this for the chip. It has Ethernet. It has Wi-Fi. It has USB. Uh, and literally, it's like uh, 20 bucks. So um, this would be a, an easy, cheap device to possibly play with. And that's, uh, as soon as I get the camera, that's uh, Vixby 300 wireless travel router. Um, I would try playing around with that. But I have to admit, it, this was kind of futzy uh, when it came to um, the actual U-boot arguments. I had a couple arguments that didn't work and I couldn't alter and stuff like that. Uh, here's another device. It's, I think it's the exact same product. They're just white label different. Uh, GL iNet and mini smart router also um, has all the same functions and features on it. I'm not sure if the Mango is still on the market. Maybe able to buy one used. So, um, nice. But a lot of these cheap devices are out there and it gives you a chance to experiment with UART and JTAG and and um, SPI chips and sometimes NAND chips and flash chips. And I mean, the list goes on and on and on and they're often cheap. Um, the, uh, like I said, the Luma I like a lot because it has all of those same features uh, and you can get them for 20, 30 bucks used. Um, you know, it has the USB, it has the ethernet, it has uh, UART connectivity. Uh, it has NAND flash chips on the device. It has, uh, SOIC 8 uh, SPI flash memory chips on the device. So it's a perfect platform for hacking, attacking, experimenting. The pin glitch works on it also uh, as an example. So, Awesome. And uh, I was just catching up in the chat. It was a fight. It was a F-E-I-T, however you pronounce that. It was a fight bulb that I had from Costco that I just decided to put and leave in the drawer because just didn't feel very secure about it. <laughs> so, 